Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brown Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We want to welcome you to this video. As always, we appreciate you tuning in. If you haven't already done so, if you consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bell as a way of staying current with our ministry here on YouTube when we go live from our assembly building on Sunday morning, as well as when we create content for you here midweek, we would certainly appreciate that. Also want to remind you about our Rumble channel here, Grace Life Bible Church on Rumble. We established this as an alt tech site. Should something happen to our YouTube ministry, so if you're into all tech sites or would like an alternative to YouTube, please consider subscribing and checking us out here on Rumble as well. My featured book this in this video is, once again, my new release from This Generation Forever, Volume 2, Preservation, A Study of God's Promise to Preserve His Word. This book covers uh, Lessons 27 through 58 or 56 of the From This Generation Forever class that we've been teaching over the last number of years during the adult Sunday school hour at Grace Life Bible Church, volume two is devoted exclusively to covering the doctrine of preservation. And so if you are into that or into text and translation and would like information on that, doc, that critical doctrine, please consider checking that out as well. My purpose in this video is once again to um, give part three of my response to evaluate this video by uh, brothers Mark Ward and Timothy Berg that was released on Thursday, July 20, 2023, evaluating some of the work of King James Version defender Brian Ross. This is part three of my response uh, to these men. Um, I would strongly suggest that if you have not watched yet parts one and two, that you stop this video right now and go and watch those first because all of these are building on each other as we work our way through uh, an analysis of this video. As I have read in the last two, I would like to begin by reading Colossians 4, 6, um, in which the Apostle Paul states, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. As I've said already, I, th I do believe that this video um, needs and deserves an answer, and it is in the spirit of Colossians 4, 6, that I am endeavoring to provide an answer, and that is in, in grace, um, although, again, there are some things here that I do think need um, to be addressed. Um, so, so far, what we've seen in parts one and two is the in part one, I showed the first third, and what we focused on on part one was what I said regarding exact and perfect in the preface. In part two, we looked at the, the middle section of the video by Brothers Berg and Ward on um, where they were talking a little bit further about some history things, some things about the translators, what the translators believe, Protestant bibliology. And we covered that in the, the second video or, the, or part two. In this video, part three, what I want to do is review what the men said regarding verbatim identicality, which is like the last third of the original video here, evaluating some of the work of King James Defender Brian Ross, okay? Now, to do that, we are going to start this. I want to remind you of something. This was covered. We heard Brother Mark Ward say this in part two, and I said that I would be commenting further in part three. So I want to remind you what he said right here around the 35-minute, 38-second mark, give or take, about translations to be you you were one of the ones who helped me see this it seems to be a very natural and intuitive thing for christian people to invest the translation in their hands with the ultimate authority that ought only to be accorded to the originals because that's a pretty mm -hmm. fine and subtle distinction when it comes right down to it and actually that distinction yeah. most of the time doesn't matter at all all the translations mm -hmm. are saying the same thing so right there that was a statement all the translate the assertion that all translations are saying the same thing. So having heard that statement again, all translations are saying the same thing. Now we want to jump ahead to about the 45 minute 20 second mark, okay, where they're winding down this discussion of the preface and they're going to begin to transition into a conversation about verbatim identicality. And then um, Brother Ward says the following. Or ever could be done, it's just meant to give a uniformity to the churches of England's liturgy. That's wonderful, Tim. That's an example of your gifting and your interest and actually your years of study. 
that I don't have a bent toward and uh, haven't taken the time to do. So I really appreciate, you know, I think our work complements uh, the other, each work, each is work complements the other. I really, mm. really, really appreciate that. Um, every time I read something on your blog that I should mention now, kjbhistory.com, mm. I come away thinking, oh man, I should have known this years ago. That is so helpful. And it's not too different from the advice that I find myself giving today. And I tend to presume you as well, that there is some prudential value in an individual church having an established translation. Mm -hmm. I remember the first time I picked up Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life. And even then I, I wasn't King James only, I was using multiple Bible translations, but he would seem to be like randomly skipping from translation to translation. And mm -hmm. the question just naturally arose, like, what's he hiding? You know, why does he have to quote the New Living Translation here, the NIV here, the King James here, the NASB here? Why can't he just pick one? Uh, and, and I've had uh, people. So if all translations are saying the same thing, why does that matter if Rick Warren picks whichever one it is that he wants or that he likes to make the point that he wants to make? If all of them are saying the same thing, why does that even matter? OK, so again, this the reason I'm starting this episode or part three in this way is because this is exactly what we're going to be looking at as this subject is going to swing and into a conversation about verbatim identicality. Editors do that to me sometimes. There mm -hmm. is a prudential value in doing that and within a given yeah. assembly having a standard. Uh, yeah. well, now I don't ESV is like a pulpit Bible at our church. Sure. And so almost all my preachings, I don't read only from the ESV, but I almost right. exclusively preach from it. And that's not the same thing as saying we're going to check people's Bibles at the door and it has to be in the right. SV. That's the kind of uniformity. We're not talking about that kind of uniformity, but right. uh, the idea that you can go to church and expect that the scripture readings and, you know, any responsive readings that are printed in the bulletin will all be from the same translation. Yeah. Fine. We I oppose textual absolutism, that. but not textual <laughs> uniformity. <laughs> yeah. Within within any given, you know, ecclesial context in, in a given church. Okay, that's a lot of talk about Brian Ross's uh, view of the preface. P a big part of me just wants to say, go read the preface. Just go read mm -hmm. it and tell me <laughs> that uh, tell me that it's consonant with any of the mainstream King James only views. It it just isn't. I don't. I've never come away from reading a King James onlyist's discussion of the preface without some feel that. They cheated, you know, they mm. they missed the the forest for one tiny little twig on a tree that they sort of, <laughs> you know, were able to explain in a way that was more amenable to their viewpoint. Mm, uh, I do think the preface is one of the most eloquent defenses of the textual confidence viewpoint that you and I hold. Um, I am trying to listen to those who are telling me I need to know, know more of the historical circumstances, and I'm certainly learning from you. So any... Any King James only view of the preface, Mark Ward thinks that they've cheated in explaining it. So, again, am I King James only here? Am I being accused of having cheated? And it seems to me like I am. I'm not sure how else I'm supposed to take that. And I find that to be an ironic statement, given what we've already observed in this series of videos, how... There's a ton of straw manning here against a position on the preface that I actually explicitly disclaimed, okay? And I went into that in detail last time. So I find it a little bit ironic that a statement is made here about cheating when we went through what I think are clear examples of appeals to authority, straw manning, misrepresenta misrepresentation, and presentism in the way that these men have decided to respond to me, okay? Now, let's hear what they have to say about verbatim identicality. Let's turn then to talk a little bit more briefly, hopefully, about Brian's other major concept here, the verbatim identicality of wording. And mm -hmm. I've pulled up a couple notes of my own. Um, I actually was able to find the passage where that King James translator oh, wonder was uh, talking in textual confidence terms. It was about Psalm 10630, but I'll just have to drop that in there and then Hopefully, I'll get to a video about it someday. But when uh, Ross, uh, okay, he, here's here's my praise of Ross, and I'm going to say this again. I feel like over and over and over again, I and others like you have said the same thing in answer to the mainstream perspective on 
on the King James and TR in King James onlyism. You know, not not everybody in that world likes that label. That's fine. Sure. You and I commonly use King James defense or TR defense or both. Yeah. KJB Those are my TR preferred defense. terms. KJB yeah, defenders like, or TR <clears throat> defenders. Yeah, I like that. <clears throat> The, the text is the issue. That's what they always say. And they commonly say uh, all over, certainly at the pastoral level and assumed at the lay level, and then even at the scholarly, more scholarly level in that world, they'll say that Bible preservation is a promise of God. Psalm 12, 6 and 7. I just got an email from one of them again today, one of these brothers saying that, why don't you see that this is a valid interpretation that, you know, thou shalt preserve them, O Lord, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them forever. That's a reference to the words. And Matthew 5, 18, not a jot or a tittle will pass from the law until all is fulfilled. And yet both the Ruckmanites to their, to their one side and the textual confidence folks, us to their other side, I won't say right and left, that isn't quite right, but uh, we're both seeing a massive inconsistency here. And that is, you say, the Bible is perfectly preserved, or in the terms of one of the confessional bibliologists, don't really want to drag that uh, that name back into it, but um, oh, he said, there. yeah, yeah. But I've heard this all over King James and TR defense, the basic idea that if we have doubt about even a single syllable, then we can't have confidence about any of it. So Chuck Surratt said, for example, he's a classic IFB, King James onlyist, and one of the best ones. Uh, he said, I don't know why people who use the critical text even bother to exegete and exposit the scriptures. I'm paraphrasing here, but I am representing him accurately. I'm confident. Mm -hmm. uh, because if they don't have confidence about every jot and tittle, why would they even bother? Why be exact in your uh, in your exposition and your exegesis? Yeah. Which I think is rather ironic because where do I encounter good exegesis and where, where do I encounter bad exegesis? <laughs> uh, I would not say it's great exegesis in King James only as in bad exegesis outside of it. I'll just leave that to the side. Um, so on both. So, I mean, note, note that <laughs> that's not really a side statement. What Brother Ward just said is that anybody who's a pro King James advocate almost by default means they're going to be a poor exeget. OK, I don't know. You can kind of uh, decide for yourself what you want to make of that statement. The implication of that statement was definitely that if you're a King James defender, if you're a TR defender, that you're uh, you're a poor exeget compared to those who don't use the, the, the King James or the TR. Um, so I'll leave it for you to decide what you think of that. Besides, statement. we're saying you're being inconsistent because you're saying we we have and we have to have a perfect text of the Hebrew Bible and of the Greek New Testament. We've repeatedly said this. Which TR is the perfect one? I, I just mm. sometimes I feel like I'm going blue in the face. And uh, ultimately, that's why I dropped out of talks with confessional bibliology, because it's like, how many times do I have to ask this without getting an answer before mm. actually I'm the one who starts to look like a fool? So um, Ross listened to that, and he's one of the few that did uh, that I've ever encountered. I mean, I'm, yeah. I can't actually think of anyone else. There must yeah, be somebody. Either. Maybe you can. And he's come up with a new view. Do we need to pause for a second? Is that is that thunder? That is thunder. I apologize. I don't have any way to silence that except for oh, no prayer. And and I feel that Brian is the only person in all of King James slash TR defense who's really listened to that question and tried to formulate a response to it. Yeah, I, I think you're right. He's you're certainly the only one I've seen formulate it that way. And I have seen people begin to follow his presentation and accept his ideas. Uh, and when I first heard him present that principle, I messaged him. I don't remember if it was email or Facebook so message or I. How, how, how we communicated, but I messaged him and said, Man, that is the strongest presentation of a King James only defense position that I have ever seen. Because the biggest problem with textual absolutism, we've talked about this a lot in the TCC videos, the biggest problem with textual absolutism is that the moment you claim a particular form of the text in the original languages or a particular form of the text in its translation, and there are different forms. I mean, I've got a facsimile of the 1769 here, and then behind me a facsimile of the 1611. And those both differ from a King James Bible that you would buy off the shelf in some of their wording. Um, but the moment you land at a particular form of the text and say, this form of the text is verbally perfect, you have to face the problem that that text has a prehistory and that it didn't always exist in that particular form. So right. you can't, on the one right. hand, claim that God preserved scripture and that this one particular form of it is above revision. 
because that form of it is already the product of revision. And that's, that's the deepest inherent weakness in textual absolutism. Right. And Ross, in some ways, I think, felt that. And he sh shifted his own position, if I've understood him correctly, from the yeah. maybe Ruckmanism would be a good word. I don't know right. if you would follow that, but kind of Gail Ripplinger's form of King James onlyism. And as he started to study and read and he came across Norton's work, and, right. and he's a great historian, and because he's a great yeah. historian, he sat down and looked at the text and the textual Teaches differences history. between editions of the King James Bible. He realized that's not tenable. That right. view simply doesn't work. And so he moderated his view to hold right. what he calls this, it's kind of a clunky phrase, perhaps, or an awkward phrase, uh, verbatim identicality of wording. And he yeah, says, and I reject that. Right. Uh, let me just pause to acknowledge edification requires intelligibility is a little bit clunky, too. So let's not blame it too hard for <laughs> Fair. Fair, fair. So I just have to say, I, I'm very glad to hear uh, Brother Ward acknowledge that. Um, in fact, it's something I've sort of been thinking for a long time. Um, it's ironic that the his tag phrase is edification requires intelligibility. And I wanted to ask, but haven't done it because I didn't want to sound like a jerk, um, was how many people understand what that means? So I am I am glad that he's acknowledging here that his edification requ requires intelligibility statement um, is also itself um, maybe somewhat clunky, as he just said. And V-I-W, I just beg him to put an E in there so it could say view. You know, oh, yes. An acronym <laughs> that would be helpful. Verbatim identicality of you know, exegetical wording, I don't know, something like that. Yeah, well, actually, we've gone on and talked about VIW without explaining it. Could you explain his view as you understand it? Yeah, as I understand it, he rejects what he calls verbatim identicality of wording. So what he means is, as he articulates a doctrine of preservation, and he's he's either just written or is almost finished writing uh, an entire work on preservation, which is his class condensed to it. I think I have his one on inspiration, volume one, and then volume two is either just released or about to be released covering his theology of preservation where he works all this out but his view shifted from kind of the mainstream king james only to use that term view to this idea that i hold to the preservation of the king james bible and i think he would still say that the king james bible is perfect and inerrant but he qualifies but i don't mean by that that every word has to have this verbatim identicality like he recognizes there are verbal and even textual changes that take place between editions of the King James Bible, and he's happy with receiving all of them as preserved. So he stepped away from that kind of what I would call the core of the textual absolutist position, right. which right. says, I must have a verbally perfect text in order to have an authoritative text. And if yeah, I don't have a I perfect have text, then I don't have an authoritative text. And we've heard that, you mentioned it, I'll add, that I heard all the time from pulpits growing up, Right. Preachers would hold up a King Indeed. James Bible and say, if there's one word in this King James Bible that's not right, you might as well go home and give up on Christianity. Like that was their thought. There's no possible way, if there's a single word in doubt, to have an authoritative text. Ross has seen the right. problem, and the historical problem in that claim, and I think the theological problem in that claim. So he's moderated his view of uh, preservation to allow for changes in wording as long as the same basic idea or concept is there which is where he, he essentially lands that sh sure the Bible is preserved. The words are preserved, but that doesn't mean that the exact wording has to be verbatim identical as he uses the phrase. Right. So I would just simply say that I would, I, I think that what brother Berg said, there is a fair summary of where I'm at. I first saw this in the year 2011 when I was studying for conferences on the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible that I had been tasked to preach at and I start and I, I got a hold of David Norton's A Textual History of the King James Bible, and I started going through it. And I realized that some of what I had been told in pro King James defense regarding the printed history of the text simply wasn't true. It wasn't factually accurate, which then sent me on a way of trying to. to but at the same time, I know because I can read English that the King James and modern versions are not saying the same thing. They are substantively different from each other. They do not have substantive doctrinal equivalence. And that is the second prong of my position, okay? Yes, I say preservation does not require verbatim identicality of wording or Xerox identicality. And the way I know that is I, I have a Bible that promises preservation, so I do not doubt the biblical promise of preservation. But when I go now and I look into history and I see 
that there is not Xerox identicality, that there is not verbatim identicality of wording. I know for me to require that out of my doctrine of preservation is requiring more than what the scriptures would teach me to believe about the doctrine of preservation. But on the flip side, I can read English and I know that modern versions and the King differ substantively from the King James. There is not verbal equivalence. Now, I didn't say dynamic equivalence. I said verbal equivalence. There is not substantive doctrinal equivalence between a King James and an NIV or a King James or an ESV because the level of change is so much so as to alter the substance. My position works upon two principles. Number one, acknowledging that there's a difference between a different way of saying the same thing and a substantive difference in meaning. A different way of saying the same thing and a substantive difference in meaning. I don't need to have verbatim identicality because I can communicate the exact same verbal substance using different words. I can say I went to the store at 630. I could say at half past six, I went to the store. Different words, same substance. Okay. What I, what I am saying is that the critical text and the modern versions have altered the substance of scripture. And that is the second prong of my position. Yes, it does not require verbatim identicality of wording, but it does require substantive doctrinal equivalence. Right. And this, like I said, is um, the first attempt I know of on the, in the King James TR world to really try to answer our constant question, which TR? It also is the reason that I've paid attention to Brian, I think, over time. Mm -hmm. um, his graciousness yeah. was a big part of that, too. It, it is hard to just want to have conversation privately with somebody who's just going to blast away at you. And he, he never does. Sure. Never, ever once. Yeah, no. Gracious and, and uh, but he contacted me, I don't know, two years ago, two and a half years ago, three years ago, and he wanted to talk. And I said, you know, I initially put him off, brother, I'm sorry. I basically said, I've been in this debate for so long. I haven't heard anything new in so many years. I, mm. I just can't promise to give time to your stuff. And he like, he like kept after me really nicely, <laughs> insisting that there was something he had to contribute. And ultimately it was this, I don't think at that point he'd actually come up with this, but ultimately. So let me comment there. Okay. I read Brother Ward's book, Authorize, in the spring of 2021. I reached out to him, I think it was May, um, about his book. And we talked for the first time, I believe, in June of 2021 when I got home from a Bible conference. Okay. My viewpoint on this, on verbatim identicality specifically and substantive doctrinal equivalence, my viewpoint on this. Um, Brother Ward wrote his book in 2018. I was already teaching this to the Saints at Grace Life Bible Church in 2016-2017 school year as I was going through the doctrine of preservation. So I came to these realizations through my own independent study. And by the way, an independent study that has put me um, at odds with some of my fellow King James Bible believers put me at odds with them in the sense that they view me with suspicion and accuse me of not being King James enough. Okay. But I cannot, I cannot ignore what are obvious historical realities, textual facts, etc. And I don't think that the cause of truth is aided by advancing an argument on the, by, by the use of bad arguments or arguments that don't make any sense. So I had already developed and advanced along this line well before um, I, I began to communicate with uh, Dr. Ward and before he even uh, published his book in 2017. It's this concept that got me, you know, sitting up and taking notice. Here's somebody who's shifting the ground uh, of debate, who's actually making an advance, although you and I are still going to mm. disagree with them. Um, w what I found is so much of everybody else, they're just a lot there's a lot of sloganeering we repeat mm. the slogans that we use and they repeat the slogans that we use yeah. and you just I have to have an every word bible yeah exactly um i i'd like to think that your terminology maybe you maybe peter helped you with this i, I didn't come up with it textual absolutism versus sexual confidence that that is an advance at least summarizing the debate but here again i, I would just add i it would be great if those positions could be summarized in writing 
in written statements, articulating the positions, offering what the scriptural justification for the positions are, and what spectrum of belief might exist within those different positions. Uh, I've said this in the previous two videos, and I'll just repeat it here, because a lot of what's being said throughout the duration of the video by Brothers Ward and, and Berg is related to their view of things on the basis of this terminology that they've adopted. Textual absolutism, textual confidence, textual skepticism, etc. Okay, um, so I do think that those things need to be stated in writing so that they um, can be concretely known by anyone who wants to read or investigate those positions. Here's the first new position on the King James TR side that I've seen for a while. But when he when he first advanced this, I messaged him and said, "Brother, you've come over to the textual confidence side. Like, th thank you. This is <laughs> this is great." And he he like chuckled, you know, over texting. If you can chuckle over texting, and said, <laughs> "Well, no, you know, I don't know if I really want to take that label." Um, but clearly, he'd seen the problems with textual absolutism. And then yeah. I go on and look at his comments, and I'm not going to name names, but here are some pretty infamous commenters, at least one of whom has questioned my salvation because I, mm. you know, am not King James only. And this is a guy who's all over the place commenting on, you know, yeah. Nick Sayers and other King James onlyist mm. uh, YouTube stuff and Facebook stuff. He's been pretty nasty, to be honest, this individual. Yeah. And he immediately accepted. Uh, Brian's verbatim identicality of wording mm. and said, yeah, I've actually been thinking about this for quite some time that, that basically it is untenable to have an absolutist view of the text. I'm like, ah, like, <laughs> why couldn't you just said that to me? Yeah. It's because I'm an enemy and it's because <laughs> Brian is on his side that he's able to right. entertain what Brian is saying. But here's my like big answer, big picture answer about verbatim identicality of Okay, so let me just say here again that I can acknowledge and appreciate the fact that what these brothers have said so far is by and large positive about w where I am at in this, okay? Um, I think that they have essentially represented accurately other than simply just the timing. I had already advanced in this direction, you know, uh, long before I ever really talk to uh, either one of these brothers with any sort of length or depth, or I even knew of, of uh, Brother Ward's book or had even read it. So like that, that's the only thing I just would say for, um, for context. Um, but now with the, now this is going to shift now towards, well, what are the problems with it? Okay. Wording. And then I want to hear, hear some of your responses. It actually is the concept of the big picture. Like at what level mm. of zoom, if you think about, about the Bible mm. as a picture, at what level of Zoom is it okay to have differences and, and not okay to have differences as long as it's saying the same thing? Like at the biggest level of Zoom, will anybody really say and can you demonstrate that any of the major modern evangelical English versions that use the critical text and maybe let's say use some Septuagint or Dead Sea Scrolls readings in the Old Testament here and there, are they presenting a different picture of the Christian faith? Mm. I mean, Scrivener certainly didn't think so. Um, I certainly don't think so. Uh, you, you have to zoom in to a certain level before you perceive any differences. And the question is, okay, yeah. well, what level? At least the principle of absolutism is workable. I, I can understand it. This has got to be absolutely perfect or it's not, uh, not authoritative at all. But the verbatim identicality of wording principle, um, I, I don't see how you can establish I think you'd have to answer the couple pages that I uh, wrote and authorized about textual criticism, uh, drawing from my own professor, Randy Leedy, in a video I put up on this channel, should, di should differences in biblical manuscripts scare Christians, he'd have to show that the differences in, uh, you know, between the critical text and any, you know, number of TR editions actually produce differences of theology or practice. Otherwise, I could say they're there isn't verbatim identicality of wording between the Texas, any Texas Receptus or any critical text, fine, but they're saying the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. Why? How come he can say that about Texas Receptus editions and I can't say it about the whole textual tradition? Okay, so I want to stop there and uh, point out a couple things, okay? So, first of all, I have addressed the pages in Authorize that Brother Ward is talking about, okay? Here is my video. 
Video number 15, thoughts on the Textual Confidence Collective. Is it true that variant readings don't impact doctrine? Mark 16, 9 through 20. And here I am with a preview on the screen of the pages in question that Brother Ward just mentioned from Authorize the Use and Misuse of the King James Bible. I addressed it in video 15, uh, using Mark 16 to frame the conversation. I addressed it in video 16, thoughts on the TCC. Is, is it true that textual variants don't impact doctrine? And here you can see embedded in the screen on my video that I made is Dr. Randy Leedy's piece that Brother Ward is talking about. So I have already addressed these issues. I have already made videos addressing this subject matter that Brother Ward is bringing up. I can only, I can only surmise then that Brother Ward has not watched these videos or is not aware of them because I've already addressed these, th this topic and I did it within the context of 1 John 5, 7. And then there's uh, thoughts on the TCC video 17. And here embedded in my video is Brother Ward's video, Should Differences in Biblical Manuscripts Scare Christians? Which is related to the Randy Leedy piece, which is related to what he said and authorized. So I, I have already addressed um, that, that subject matter. I've done it in three videos, almost three hours of, of, of addressing from different angles in these in the three videos video 15 16 and 17 in my thoughts on the textual confidence collective i will put in the description to this video links to those so that you can watch them on your own now i'm not going to in this video repeat every single thing i said in those three hours worth of of information because i've already done it i've already set it on the table and i have already um addressed what um, Brother Ward brings up in the video here um, that 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 we're reviewing. Okay, so I've I've already done that. I've already addressed those issues. Okay, um, let's just keep going here. Um, I have a few more things to say in a minute. Janus, you know, maybe some crazy outliers out there, some manuscripts that are really truly horrible. Um, I I'm back to saying what I used to say along with Peter Gurry to the folks in confessional bibliology, like. How come you guys get to have variants and we don't? As soon as we have variants, they're all they're all bad. <laughs> okay, but the, the the fundamental question is what is the nature of the variant? Is the nature of the variant a different way of saying the same thing, or is the nature of the variant a substantive difference in wording? Is it substantive? Is it altering the text? You cannot leave out the last 12 verses of Mark and tell me that it doesn't impact doctrine when there's a verse in Mark 16 that clearly is teaching and asserting the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, the bodily ascension, excuse me, of Jesus Christ. So is the ascension, is the bodily ascension of Jesus Christ necessary doctrine to the Christian faith? So if you leave out the last 12 verses of Mark, you're going to leave out Mark 16, 19. So then the Lord, after he had spoken unto them, was received up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. That is a verse on the bodily ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that not cardinal doctrine? Okay. Now we're going to, we're going to, so we're going to leave that out. You say, well, parallel influence, harmonization and parallel influence says that it's other places. Okay. Well, you say it's in Luke. So we could go to the book of Luke. Let's go to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, verse 51. And it came to pass that while he blessed them, that he was parted that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. But lo and behold, the attestation of that verse wants to be questioned by text critics in Luke chapter uh, 24, verse 51. The 1988 rendition of the New American Standard Bible left the verse out, put it in brackets or footnotes or whatever, questioned its authenticity on the basis of text criticism. So now we have it. the bodily ascension is missing from Mark 16 if you leave out the last 12 verses. If you leave out the last 12 verses, if you leave out uh, Mark, or sorry, Luke 24, 51, now it's not in Luke either, which means you would go through the gamut of the entire gospel record, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, without reading about the bodily ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. So is that cardinal doctrine or not? Luke 1 is part one of a two-part treatise addressed to Theophilus, the second part being the, the, the book of Acts. Somebody says, well, it doesn't matter if it's in Luke 24 because it's in the book of Acts. So was it not essential then for Theophilus to believe in the bodily ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ until he received the book of Acts as part two of the two-part treatise? See, this is, this, this is my problem. As a believing biblicist, 
I do. I cannot accept the idea that none of these variants impact doctrine. And I don't need to know Greek to know this. Because the reason they're different in English is because of what they're translating. The reason why they want to leave out Mark 16, the last 12 verses of the book of Mark, is because they're not in two ancial codices. That's it. Okay? So I don't buy this thing. So th those are differences in very, th those are variant readings that impact doctrine. They are substantive differences in meaning. Okay? So the Word of God allows for a certain, the, the level of variance in Zoom that we should be looking for is how the scriptures would teach us to think about that issue. Uh, or um, they're all malicious somehow. They're all an effort to omit or add some doctrine, but your variants that you have to account for don't. And that's why I wrote my paper uh, for the article came out in Detroit Baptist Seminary Journal, and I'll let you talk after this. That pointed out that the very same kinds of differences that occur between Scrivener's TR and the Nestle and Lawn 28, you know, TR and critical text, those same kinds of differences occur between different TR editions, minus the big three, 1 John 5, 7, John 7, 53 to 8, 11, Woman Caught in Adultery, uh, and uh, Mark 16, 9 to 20, the so-called longer ending of Mark. I, I feel right. like verbatim identicality of wording is actually just another way of saying those three passages mean we should keep the King James. Let's say that's all it means. Are you saying that including 1 John 5, 7 versus excluding 1 John 5, 7 doesn't matter? doesn't affect the doctrine because that is certainly as i went through in uh, episode number 16 and in, in the, my thoughts on the textual confidence collective we went through dr theodore lee's psd phd dissertation where he demonstrated that a a variation in text in first john 5 7 eventually led to the overthrow and the formation of Unitarianism and a, and a denial of the Orthodox Christian faith because of the text variant and the snowball effect that that had. So if you're only talking about the woman taken in adultery, if you're only talking about the long ending of Mark, and if you're only talking about 1 John 5, 7, you, my second principle says if you include those or exclude those, you are substantively altering the doctrinal content of the text. You either have a clear, you either have a clear attestation to the doctrine of the Trinity in 1 John 5, 7, or you don't. You either have the bodily ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ in Mark 16, or you don't. So even if it only applies, even if one's only going to argue for the retention of the King James based upon those three, those three are substantive. Now, I'm not the only one that thought this. I have on my bookshelf over here, The Orthodox Corruption of the Church by Bart Ehrman, and he says that. Now, see, but Ward and Berg don't like Bart Ehrman because he's a liberal. But... Airman says how you settle text differences does impact doctrine, and that's coming from somebody that is a highly credentialed member of the School of Text Criticism. Okay? Now, again, I dealt with all of those issues also in my thoughts on the Textual Confidence Collective, which one can only surmise what, uh, has not been watched by these two brothers when they put this video together. Now you talk. Mm. Yeah, so I think Ross would say, and we've talked about this before on the phone, if I remember correctly, I think he would say, well, I feel like I can't land it, quote unquote, your position, because I feel like those passages are a big deal. I feel like Acts 837 is drastically different in a King James. They are a big deal. And Brother Berg is right. That is why I can. So my position, my my verbatim identicality view keeps me from saying things on the pro King James side that are ahistorical, not factually accurate, and that are wrong. But I cannot therefore swing to the other side of this and say that the obvious differences between the versions aren't substantive. That they aren't that they do, that they're not doc, substantive doctrinal differences depending on how you want to which variants you want to include or not include. Bible versus uh, modern English translation, unless you have the Holman Christian Standard Bible, I think, which might still have it either in the text 
or bracketed in the text, something like that. Um, I feel like those variants are a big deal. But I would want to say in response, well, so do lots of Christians and textual critics like a Maurice Robinson, you know, someone who holds a, a Byzantine priority position. They too right. would point at, maybe not Acts 37 because that's not a Byzantine uh, variant, but they would point at many of the textual variants and say, yeah, that's theologically significant. It makes a difference in this particular passage. And I do think we have to be careful um, when we speak about the weight and nature of variants that we don't make them sound like they are insignificant in every way, shape, and form. They do change yeah. the meaning of a particular text. They change the meaning of a particular text. I love it when people make my point for me. What, it, whether you include it or not, it's changing the mean. It substantively is altering the doctrinal content of the text. So instead of me justifying my Zoom, I feel these brothers have to justify how can they acknowledge, you just heard it acknowledged, that they do change the meaning of the text, but then say none of these changes matter. None of these micro-level changes matter because the macro issue is what we care about. When I read my Bible, I read, I read about how no prophecy of the scriptures have any private interpretation. I read in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul talking about that the Holy Spirit teaches by comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. So if I'm making micro level adjustments, how does that not affect the macro level understanding of what the, what the scriptures are teaching? And by the way, I'll add at this point the following, okay? Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The modern critical text and modern versions leave off through his blood. And they'll say, modern text critics will say, well, that doesn't matter because it's in Col it's in Ephesians. And, uh, you know, there's a harmonization there in the scribe, you know, he just accidentally inserted through his blood. And I, and I want, the, my, my answer to that is, really? So the Coloss, the church in Colossae is a church that Paul had, that had never seen Paul's face in the flesh. The book of Colossians was a standalone book that is sent to an independent church. Did they need to know about the blood atonement? Did they need to believe in the blood atonement? Okay. Same thing with same thing with what I've said about Luke and the bodily ascension and Mark and the bodily ascension. Okay. Are these things just things that people can wait to believe? And you know, there's there's other things about this that I want to point out. Uh, there's basic there's basic uh, factual irregularities between the modern versions themselves. Here's 2 Samuel 15, verse 7, New American Standard. Now it came about the end of 40 years that Absalom said to the king, the ESV, at the end of four years, Absalom said to the king. What, which is it? Is it four years or is it 40 years? Ecclesiastes 8.10, okay? The King James here reads, uh, And so I saw the wicked buried, uh, which had come and gone from the place of the holy, and they were forgotten in the city. New American Standard, Ecclesiastes 8.10, So then I have seen the wicked buried, now those who used to go in and out from the holy place, and they were soon forgotten in the city. ESV says, and they were soon praised in the city. So were they forgotten in the city, or were they praised in the city? Is that not substantive? See, Brother Berg just admitted that, yes, these how you reconcile textual variant does impact individual readings. But then they want to say, but on the macro level, this doesn't matter. It doesn't impact the, the, the overall message of the Bible. How about Luke 10, 1, New American Standard? Now, after this, the Lord appointed 70 others. ESV, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others. So is it 70 years at 72? So the modern versions d disagree among themselves about, about these things. What about Mark chapter 1, verses 2 through 3, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet? But the, the, the quotation is a compound quotation from Malachi and Isaiah. The King James in the traditional text says, as it is written in the prophets, because the quotation is from two different prophets. But they'll say, well, you know, that doesn't really matter because I'm not saying these brothers would say this, but this is what I read in James White and other places. That doesn't matter because what you really need to understand, brother, is you need to understand first century Jewish citation methods. 
And I'm like, okay, what verse tells me that that? So now I need to understand that to understand a verse and why part of a verse that says it's in Isaiah isn't in Isaiah. And I think to myself, are we Protestants or aren't we? Do we need to know now first century Jewish citation methods in order to understand a verse? Or do we just acknowledge the fact that one of these is wrong? And they're not saying the same thing. Whether you want to say, okay, if you don't want to say I'm, that one of them is wrong, if that's too strong, they're not substantively agreeing with each other because one's telling you a verse is in Isaiah when it's not in Isaiah. Um, this issue about Jesus Christ in John 7, go ye up unto the feast. I go not up unto this, I, I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. The critical text in modern versions leave out the word yet. But then you go down two verses later, but when his brethren were gone up, then when he also up unto the feast. The critical texts in the modern version have Jesus contradicting himself out of his own mouth without any explanation. Now, if that, so is that substantive? And by the way, if it's substantive at a micro level, what is this now saying about Jesus Christ himself? that he contradicts himself out of his own mouth. Isn't that reason now to judge a deeper doctrine or to, to call question onto a deeper doctrine? What about Matthew chapter 5, verse 22? But I say unto you that whosoever, with his whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause in the King James. New American Standard, ESV, critical text, modern versions, they leave out the phrase without a cause. But when I go to Mark chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus looks around it with anger. So if the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, gets angry, does he have a cause to be angry? But you see, when you take that out of, when you take that, that phrase out, now you're creating problem with, the, with another verse, which now can be used to call into question the integrity of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, I don't need to know Greek to see this. I don't need to know Greek to see this. I can see it by reading English. And I know that the reason why without a cause is missing in the modern version is because it's not in the Greek. I don't need to know Greek to know that that is a substantive altering of a text. And what Brother Ward, what Brother Ver just did is he admitted that yes, how you reconcile these text variations does impact what the text means. Well, how is that only possible at a micro level, but not at a macro level? Does First John five seven teach the uh, teach the Trinity or doesn't it? So I have two principles. Number one, a difference between a substantive difference in meaning and a different way of saying the same thing. And number two, my principles of verbatim identicality of wording and substantive doctrinal equivalence. I think if King James advocates will think about it for a minute, they'll realize that the reason why, you know, I've heard, I've seen and read so many things that things that are different are not the same. And that's true. Like, for example, the, the, the verse in Colossians 2, intruding into those things which he hath not seen. But the modern critical texts in the modern versions say that you've seen them. So they're teaching opposites. One says you haven't seen it. The other one says you have. And by the way, if you have that, talk, that verse is talking about angels and, and, and uh, it's a verse about angelology in Paul's epistles. If you go to Colossians chapter 1, he talks in verses uh, 16, 17, 18, he talks about thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers in heaven and earth that are visible and invisible, that are occupied by spiritual beings. And he says the ones that are in the heavens are invisible. So how you reconcile the text variant creates potential tension for what else? What it says elsewhere in the book of Colossians. So, like, all of these things, the re real reason why people who are King James advocates reject it is because they understand that the changes are so significant that they are substantively altering the text, the content of the text. That is my second position. And I will say it again. If, if. If what Brother Berg, it, it, what he just admitted that the text variants do impact the understanding of a particular passage, these brothers need to be justifying why they're saying that, that they're all saying the same thing, when how you reconcile the variant impacts the substance of what's being said. Airman knows that.
and this is uh, obviously those Gurry big three made. you mentioned. I'm yeah. sorry. Peter Gurry has made this point, and I and I think myths and mistakes, or I know I've heard him say it. We got to be yeah. careful way, the way we shade that. I, I acknowledge that. Yeah, and I've, I've heard Elijah say that as well too. <clears throat> careful textual critics know that if we just sloganeer on our own end and say textual variants are insignificant, and that does get repeated sometimes in popular culture, uh, popular level discussions of these things, well, that's not an accurate view because textual variants matter. They change what a particular text means. And of course, in the big three, some of those are very significant differences. First John 5, 7 either affirms the Trinity, and we have a clear statement of Trinitarian witness, possibly a modalist one, depending on how you interpret it, but ah. a clear statement of Trinitarian witness in the scripture, or we don't. That is a significant theological variant. Um, but I think we can still maintain with Erasmus um, and many who have followed in his train what you said earlier, the real case that has to be made is not that a particular variant changes a particular text of the Bible and what it means. It has to be shown that it changes the shape of the Christian faith, the shape of Christian doctrine as a whole. And Erasmus was convinced and stated over and over again in his correspondence, textual variants don't threaten the Christian faith. Christian If you take the last 12 verses of Mark out, you take out the bodily resurrect, the bodily ascension of Christ. And by the way, like, are we, is, are we sure that we're understanding here exactly what Erasmus said? Because Erasmus knew of at least 40 textual variants in Codex Vaticanus that he rejected as spurious. So, now when we're using Erasmus, are we using Erasmus to, to talk about apples and apples? Or are we talking about apples and oranges? Christianity stands the same right. either way. And of course, that's a claim that gets repeated in the 1700s. And we've talked about that in the TCC, lots of later literature. People realized, good, careful textual critics realized, if you take the textual variants, you can put almost any combination of them together that you want. And you'll change the meaning of that text, but you'll never change the ultimate message of Scripture. So I think the burden of proof is on Ross if he's going to, there's a very clear line between what we've called textual absolutism and textual confidence. And that line is, do you hold that a form of the text is completely above revision, uh, verbally perfect, essentially, or don't you? And the textual absolutist position says, here's a form of the text that's completely above re revision. Anything that doesn't say that's on the other side of the line. So from your and my perspective, Ross seems like in the textual confidence camp, he wouldn't title himself that way. He would say, no, I'm still a KJB defender, but he now then has the onus put on him to say, how can you draw the line where you do? Without that real clear differentiation, if you've stepped over to allow a change in wording, how do you weigh what is and isn't significant enough to matter to draw two big, huge, massive, uh, contrasting and conflicting positions? So again, how can you guys say that it doesn't matter and that all the ver all the translations say the same thing when you just admitted that how you resolve a text variant impacts what that text is saying. So how can we have six different, how can we have, let's just keep it to two, how can we have two different understandings of a text and say that, um, well, they're all saying the same thing. See, here's the problem. Again, a lot of this biblical literature was originally stuff that was sent or addressed to individual people, individual churches, and it, it and now they're now they're bringing all this stuff together once the canon has been sort of compiled and finalized, and now they're making this argument. Well, you know, this micro level thing here doesn't impact the macro level. I don't understand. I don't understand how you can make that argument. Should the individual micro reading read A or should it read B? And if you say it reads A or B, how does that not impact the greater picture? And again, Airman would not agree with this. He says, how you reconcile these impacts, the, the shape of the Christian faith. So evangelical text critics and those in the text critical community, they want, they want, they need people to buy this idea that none of these things impact doctrine. They're all saying the same thing. When I'm saying I can read and I know that that's not the case, and I don't need to know how to translate originally from Greek to be able to understand this in English. How do you justify the length or depth of Zoom, as you, you stated it earlier? 
Yeah, that's so good. And I was actually trying to find while we were talking the quotation, and I have it here. I just kind of wanted to show it. I'm going to show it on my screen. Wanted to show it from the works of Erasmus, but for some reason I cannot find the exact reference. Um, he says, Erasmus says, has anything happened to the Christian religion? Because for many centuries now, Jerome has offered one reading, Cyprian another, Hilary another, that's Hilary of Poitiers, Ambrose another, Augustine another. Among these authors, you will find readings that are not only different, but even contradictory, though they agree on the essentials of the Christian faith. And I know I have this here in, uh, in my PDF. Oh yeah, here it is. Okay, it's page 463. So if you don't believe me, this is the collected works of Erasmus, you know, the progenitor of the TR. Yep, there you go. And you're the one who put me onto this here, um, Tim. So again, though, like Ver Erasmus never accepted variant readings as authentic that he knew existed in Codex Vaticanus. So what what are we really talking about here in this point and, and he's taking very clearly a textual confidence view which is not what rb willett said you know i tend to doubt that rb willett has actually read any erasmus i myself have not read a ton but i read enough to come across lots of quotes like this in this volume 41 the new testament scholarship of erasmus an introduction with erasmus's preface and ancillary writings i think um, the verbatim identicality of wording view, <clears throat> it just puts a sort of technical label on a version of textual confidence, so that's good, that, and this part is the bad part, that artificially restricts the, uh, the range of view, that is, mm. how many manuscripts are we allowed to examine in order to discern which variants ought to be translated in, you know, our new Bible translation or revision, mm. if, it, if it ever happens in a, co a course with the King James. But these brothers just admitted that the how you reconcile a variant impacts what a text is saying, but then want their listeners to accept the fact that but none of that matters to the shape of the Christian faith. I mean, you can believe that if you want to, but like, I think, I think they need to justify their level of zoom and why it's okay for them to acknowledge that textual variants do impact what things say, but don't change the shape of the, of the Christian faith. The Christian faith is based upon what the word of God teaches. So if you alter the substantive content of the scriptures, how are you not impacting the shape of the Christian faith? I don't understand. My position acknowledges variance. My position acknowledges different types of variance, different ways of saying the same thing versus substantive differences in meaning. But then I have another principle that says no. When when you alter the substance, the, either the word of the word of God claims to be pure. That is the Bible's claim for itself. And so my definition of this, I'm reading from page uh, 252 of my book. I say I believe in perfect preservation. If by perfect one means the existence of a pure text that does not report information about God, His nature or character, His doctrine, His dispensational dealings with mankind, history, archaeology, or science that is false. In short, God's promise to preserve, preserve his word ensures, it assures, excuse me, the existence of a text that has not been altered in its character or doctrinal content, despite not being preserved in a state of verbatim identicality. That is a circumscribed understanding based upon, number one, obviousness when it comes to variants, and number two, acknowledging different ways of saying the same thing are not the same as substantive differences in meaning. These brothers have acknowledged that how they rectify variants creates substantive differences in understanding, but then they have gone and say, but none of those, none of those impact the shape of the Christian faith. And they've used Erasmus to try to justify this when Erasmus rejected many, or at least 40, of the textual variants that are found in Codex Vaticanus, 
which was one of the principal witnesses that was used to undermine the text of the Reformation. And I'll say, while we're on the subject of history, when the revised version of 1881 was printed, when it was published, okay, there were, it was immediately reviewed in both the American and the British press. So here we have the Free Religious Index, okay? Uh, this is a weekly paper. This is published in Boston, Massachusetts, and it's published in 1881. So right at the same time that the RV came out. We can go to page 103 of this, and we can see a Free Religious Index issue from Boston, May 26, 1881. This is, uh, the, a revised version was published in May of 1881, and let's go to the final paragraph of this piece. And we think that the certain effects of this acceptance of the revised version will be the increase of more rational views about the Bible. A book that can be amended cannot be infallible. Yet thousands of readers of the King James Version have read it in the firm belief that they were reading an infallible book. So well before modern King James onlyism, the average American or British Christian read the King James Bible and they accepted it as God's word. And they accepted it as authoritative and infallible book. Okay. They will now begin to see that this belief at least was mistaken. But since no claim is made that the new revising committee has been inspired and their process of working with the instrumentalities of human scholarship is even frankly described as the have these readers an infallible book now? Have all mistakes been corrected? Are these manuscripts that are talked about? On what authority do they rest? See, these, these are the exact questions. And so the question of infallibility having once been started among the readers who never raised it before, it may not rest until it reached the question of original authorship and the popular theories of the Bible be reconstructed on a more rational basis. What is he saying? They're saying that text lower criticism leads to higher criticism. That is exactly what Dr. Theodore Letus argued in his doctoral thesis, where he talked about 1 John 5, 7 and the text variant at 1 John 5, 7. Tell me these guys didn't understand that these variants impacted the shape of the Christian faith. They absolutely understood it. They knew it when they saw it. From this point of view, therefore, the Revised New Testament has a special interest for liberals. That the revision on points, now watch, where any doctrinal change is involved favors liberal Christian rather than orthodox interpretation is also apparent. How can these people in the time period read this and acknowledge that this is impacting Christian doctrine and that it is advancing a more liberal form of Christianity than what had previously existed with the King James Bible? How can they understand that and our modern text critical community n not get that? It's just that they want, that's, that's the selling point that they're selling, okay? But it is a matter of much less moment. Now watch that the setting that then setting the Bible reader's wits to work on the question whether the Bible he is reading is an infallible book. Let the question once fairly get started among the plain among the plain thinking people of Christendom in the 19th century, and the 20th century will answer it by placing the Bible on the library shelves alongside of other historical religious books classified as one as the human literatures of the world's religions. Folks, did these people understand that the doctrinal changes that were resonant in the RV favored liberal Christianity and were substantive and doctrinal in nature? Yes, they did. We could go to the Dublin Review. The Dublin Review, this is the July through October edition, again, from... 1881. We want to go to page 154. On page 154, there is a long article on the revision of the New Testament. So this is also about the revised version, okay? And we want to jump to the discussion here of verbal inspiration. This is in this piece. There, fundamental doctrine of verbal inspiration is undermined. This piece is saying, with uh, we have spoken of the omissions, the peculiarities, and the omissions of the newly revised version. 
It only means to express our deep anxiety as to its effect upon the religious mind of England and Scotland. It cannot but give a severe not but give a severe shock to those who have been brought up in the strictest sense of Protestantism. Their fundamental doctrine of verbal inspiration is undermined. So here again is a piece, a, a primary source piece, congruent with the release of the revised version in 1881, saying that it impacts doctrine, notably the verbal inspiration. The land of John Knox will mourn its dying Calvinism. The prophets of Bible religion will find no more sure word for for the lord in the new gospel but assuredly the the broad church will widen their tents yet more and rejoice in the liberty wherewith textual criticism hath made them free already one of their great oracles himself a reviser hath declared that inspiration is not part not in a part but in the whole not in a particular passage but in the general tendency and drift of the completed words and he teaches a new way to convert the working class from their unbelief. The real way, he says, quote, to reclaim them is from the church, frankly, to admit that the documents on which they base their claims to attention are not to be accepted in blind obedience, but are to be tested and sifted and tried by all the methods that patience and learning can bring to bear. Then heaven help the poor working class if if his sole hope of salvation lays in the new gospel of textual criticism. Well, what will those think who outside of the Catholic Church still retain the old Catholic ideas about church and scripture? How bitter to them must be the sight of their Anglican bishops sitting with Methodist, Baptists, and Unitarians to improve the English Bible according to the modern ideas of progressive biblical criticism. Who gave these men the authority over the written word of God? It is not Parliament or the Privy Council, but the Church of England acting through convocation. To whom do they look for the necessary sanction and approval for their work but to public opinion? One thing at least is certain. The Catholic Church will gain by the new revision both directly and indirectly. Directly because old errors are removed from the translation. Indirectly because the Bible-only principle is proved to be false. It is now it is now at length too evident that the scriptures that the scripture is powerless without the church as the witness to its inspiration, the safeguard of its integrity, and the exponent of its meaning. And it will now be clear to all men which is the true church, the real mother to whom the Bible of right belongs. Nor will it need Solomon's wisdom to see that the so-called church, which heartlessly gives up the hapless child to be cut in pieces by textual criticism, cannot be the true mother. Whoa. Did these people think that this stuff impacted doctrine? I'll, I think the answer is pretty obvious. The Bible, what it is and is not, a series of Sunday evening lectures, delivered in Old Meeting Church by Joseph Wood from 1892. Page 59. The Revised Version, whoops, the Revised Version is of great doctrinal significance, intends to break down the rigidity of orthodoxy, and it justifies the liberal Christianity which we in this place hold and teach. So here's a liberal Christian saying the, uh, the, the Revised Version breaks down the rigidity of orthodoxy and favors liberal Christianity doctrinally. We, at any rate, have every reason to be grateful for the help which the Revised Version gives us to better understand the work of Christ and the Apostles. We who know the fatal force and fascination of words have learnt to realize the immense and inconceivable mistakes which have been made by nearly all English churches through the deficiencies and mistakes of the authorized version, welcome with deepest thankfulness the Bible which the revisers have placed in our hands as bringing before the English reader for the first time the true sense of the inspired words. Did these liberals rejoice, these theological liberals, that they rejoice over the publication of the revised version because they knew it favored their doctrine over Christian orthodoxy? So again, did they understand that all the translations were saying the same thing? They most certainly did not. So the onus is not on me. 
the onus, it seems to me, is on these brothers to prove how they can admit that how you reconcile a text critical variant in a given place does alter what that says, but yet it doesn't impact doctrine. And last, we can go to the text and margin of the Revised New Testament Affecting Theological Doctrine by George Vance Smith from 1881. George Vance Smith was a Unitarian who sat on the revision committee. He denied the doctrine of the Trinity. He was on the committee. He writes this book. He writes this tract. Again, the text and margins of the Revised New Testament affecting theological doctrine. The whole point of his book is to give examples of how the Revised Version altered the doctrine. At all events, this is from page 6, at all events, it will be seen that the changes which have been introduced into the Revised Version in several conspicuous instances in, in, important, um, in several conspicuous instances, an important bearing upon theological doctrine as usually derived from the New Testament. Does he think that it's impacted the doctrine? Does he think they're all saying the same thing? No, he certainly does not. He thinks that he, he, he thinks that this one differs from the AV because of the way that it has altered the readings. And then we could go to the conclusion. Notice, conclusion, the doctrinal results of the revision. So this is page, what page is this? Page 45. Since the publication of the Revised New Testament, it has been frequently said that the changes of translation which the work contains are of little importance from a doctrinal point of view. In other words, that the great doctrines of popular theology remain unaffected, untouched by the results of the revision. How far this assertion is correct, the careful reader of the foregoing pages will be able to judge for himself. So, George Vance Smith, a Unitarian, who sat on the committee. No one ever wants to deal with this. OK, I never hear anybody talking about this. George Van Smith was a Unitarian. He sat on the revision committee. He wrote this and he said, look, this idea that none of what we've done here impacts doctrine is not true. And he goes through an entire list of ways that the doctrinal critical, the text critical choices that were made and the translational decisions that were made by the committee on the RV did change and revise Orthodox Christian doctrine. So I don't understand how these men can say what they say while they admit that how you revise a text critical method does impact what the text says. And the, the mainstream evangelical view that you and I hold is that I, I actually, in a way, kind of like he tried to turn the tables on me with uh, calling out a false friend, in the uh, in the King James epistle dedicatory, I think actually it's our view which takes a higher view of God's powers of preservation because we mm. are trying to use all of the manuscripts that God preserved to to weigh them and count them to consider everything that God has done in in history, and you just don't have a Bible passage that tells you how to and where to restrict that viewpoint. And I don't think verbatim right. identicality of wording is sufficient to do it. And I brought this out in that Detroit paper. There are places where there's actually a contradiction, a formal contradiction between different TR editions. One of my favorite is in James 2, where um, the, uh, the one uses the word uh, with and the one uses the word without and like show me your faith mm -hmm. by your works and show me your faith without your works. I mean, that's mm -hmm. if, if you zoom in that tightly, that is a contradiction. How could they possibly both be uh, preserved by God? Now, actually, I prefer to. Zoom out further and say, well, if you look at the whole verse, the whole argument it's the same argument, but right. how come that principle, like he's allowed to choose the zoom level, but I'm not, I, mm. I don't think I, I, ca I cannot find that viewpoint compelling for that reason. I can't find the viewpoint compelling that you've heard described in this video. Okay. So 
Reading from my book, page uh, 374, a statement was made earlier and I got sidetracked. I had somebody come and pick up my mower to be serviced, so I apologize for any awkwardness there. But the statement was made about no verse talks about like variants and what 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 should or shouldn't be. I think the scriptures teach three principles for identifying the, the preserved text. The first one is multiplicity of copies. So this is page 374. God's design was to preserve his word in a multiplicity of accurate, reliable copies that were just as authoritative as the originals. Therefore, we ought to be able to observe in history a collection of manuscripts that are plenteous and in substantive agreement with each other regarding doctrinal content, despite not possessing verbatim wording. Now, that's what we see in the Byzantine tradition. And then we also have a whole Latin tradition that uh, is going to speak to that. And in a minute in the video, Brothers Ward and Berg are going to talk about, well, these silly King James people, they don't understand the difference between manuscripts and TR editions. Okay, I understand. TR editions are printed representations of a given manuscript tradition, the manuscript tradition. But you should be looking for a text that is witnessed in a multiplicity of copies that are in substantive doctrinal agreement with each other, but don't, but don't, don't necessarily have to have verbatim wording. Second, a text that is available and accessible. The preserved text would not only exist in a multiplicity of copies, but these copies would be available to God's people to possess, study, believe, and preach from. They would not be hidden in a rock, in the sand, or inaccessible library. The idea that the true text of the Bible is in a, in a Vatican library that nobody can see or not even known to exist until 1844, in the case of Codex Sinaiticus, it doesn't fit with how God's word would teach you to think about this. And that's where I'm ultimately at. I'm a believing biblicist on these issues. And the reason why I am where I am and fall where I fall on the history and on the translation side is because what the how the Bible teaches me to think about these issues. And thirdly, the third hallmark of preservation is a text that's in use. A third biblical mark of the preserved text would be used by God's people for generations. God's word was preserved through the dynamic of people handling it, not in one copy sitting on a bookshelf for 500 to 1,000 years. That is not the way God preserves his word. He preserves his word by keeping it in the hands of Bible-believing people, and those people are charged with the responsibility to execute God's purpose. Dr. Wilbur Pickering, on a book I have over here on my shelf, says that and it is that there is no, he says, he says that Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus had no, they were never copied, they were never used, and that's objective. The form of the text that was foisted upon the body of Christ in 1881 represents a text literally that no one had ever seen, much less used, for the first nearly 1900 years of the history of the dispensation of grace, of the history of the church. I don't know. So there are biblical principles guiding my thinking on this at every point. Yeah. And I, I will say, I think Ross focuses, I, I, I have not followed everything that he writes or all of his videos, uh, but I think he focuses on the King James itself rather than TR editions. Uh, for the most part, I, I don't hear him very often talk about textual variants. Um, but yeah, you're you're right. There's how do you justify where you draw the line? If you've given up the idea of a sharp line between verbatim identicality or, or textual absolutism, as we've called it, and a textual confidence view, how do you justify where you are now drawing the line to say only the King James or variations of the King right. James throughout history are allowed? How do you justify that drawing of the line? And I, I don't think you can. Well, and I would just simply say, how do they justify admitting and acknowledging the textual variance impact doctrine, but then saying all the translations say the same thing? Well, you know, you brought up a touchy topic that will alienate some people who watch this and will help convince others. The simple fact is Brian cannot read Greek. He's been open about that. He's been clear with me. I mean, I, you don't know anything different, do you? Um, I and, don't know that we've ever talked about it, but I, I do well, know that. From what I've seen of his content, he focuses on the King James itself, right. occasionally looking at you know the background text behind it. But I don't see him talk about textual variants or uh, yeah. TR editions or manuscripts much. I don't see any KJB or TR defenders talk about manuscripts per se. They, right. they almost never examine the manuscripts themselves. In fact, they constantly, 
call printed editions manuscripts. They talk about the TR manuscripts. And there's a technical sense in which I could understand that to mean the manuscripts that Erasmus relied upon, but that's not what they mean. Um, right. I, I catch that kind of simple, clear error all the time. It's just difficult to have a conversation with people who don't. Not an error that I have used in my argumentation. Yeah, about a technical topic when they don't get the terminology right. So right. I patiently correct them over and over again. Well, Brian, I've gone back and forth with him about some Greek sometimes, or tried mm -hmm. to, and, and found very quickly. And, you know, he's humble enough to acknowledge this, but he sure. can't. There, what can you do? How can you have that argument? And and if people say, well, that, sh that shouldn't be relevant, we should be able to come to the right conclusion on this without knowing your Hebrew. I mean, I think there's, there's truth in that. You should be able to have good theology, even if you can't read sure. Hebrew or Greek. But so I am self-taught. I've taught myself how to wade through and read lexicons and et cetera. I have not had a I've not had formal Greek schooling, but I, I can read an interlinear. And the King James translators could read an interlinear. And they could translate the text that they had in front of them. So. I, you, you got me. I, I don't formally know Greek. I'm self-taught. Right, you are going to end up relying Protestant principle. Oh, right. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I no, didn't interject there. We can say that because we hold to the same principle that the King James translators did, and that's right. enshrined in the Westminster Confession of Faith 1.8, that scripture is translatable. So you do have an authoritative text when, even when your only access to it is in English translation. Wait a minute. I thought we didn't. If you watch part two, we heard we 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 heard ten minute block of quotes from King James translators writing saying that the Protestant the 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 the, the standard Protestant view was that the trans that the original language was prominent, the Bible was translatable, but translations were always errant. But now they're authoritative. So, like, you can say that I have to explain my Zoom level, but, like, I think there's a lot of explaining to do here, too, on how all these things that seem to be contradictory are are, are working together. Right. Uh, and then when Brian goes on, though, to, okay, if he's going to make an argument that we would say goes beyond Scripture, right, that the Scripture does not tell us we think that we're going to get a perfect translation or certainly then how to find the one that's perfect. Um, he necessarily has to dig into Greek. And he but notice how the word perfect is being used there. The word perfect is being used there with the assumption of verbatim identicality. Again, a principle, my own terminology, that I have said, you can't have, there is not verbatim identicality. So I have, because I'm not formally schooled in Greek, my arguments are therefore of no purchase. Yet, he doesn't know the language. And a lot of times I want to say, how do you know that there is uh, that verbatim identicality of wording, that principle doesn't undercut your use of a TR-based Bible translation? Um, if you can't look at the evidence for yourself, you know, I've done some work to put it into English at the KJV Parallel Bible site. It's coming into Logos soon. I got, I'm about to write the preface oh, yeah. for that. I got some endorsements for, for it yesterday. Um, uh, but how does he know? You know, th that is a frustration for me. Uh, that also came up, by the way, when he wanted to talk about 1 Corinthians 118 and the New King James says those who are being saved. Mm. And when I try to engage him and say, but it is a present progressive, you know, I, I, I gave the various grammatical arguments. We just couldn't get anywhere. To that, I would just simply say, check out my video here uh, that I did on this particular topic. Are saved or being saved? Further thoughts on 1 Corinthians one eighteen, which I produced and made as a result of my conversations with Brother Ward. Because he does not know those things. Uh, how, if you're going to, you know, brethren, be not many masters is what I'd say. Mm -hmm. So normally, actually, Brian does stick to his strengths and sticks to history. 
and he comes up with some great stuff. He really does. Yeah. But when he gets over into areas that he hasn't studied, there's some folly and shame that creeps in there. And I, I think that verbatim identicality of wording is a principle he cannot work out to its full until he learns Greek, which I would welcome. And let's continue having that conversation. But for these two yeah. big reasons that we brought up, uh, we have to say, and, and you can shade this differently if you want, Tim, but Brian is one of the best in King James and TR defense. Um, he's made the first major advance in that world that I think is actually really tried in good faith to respond to uh, decades, actually, of the which TR questions been asked from our side of things. So I honor him for that. I think that speaks well of him. And yet he has remained teaching doctrine that is divisive and that ends up uh, imprisoning God's word in a language that is no longer fully intelligible. And I think that is at best, as you well know, in tension with the teaching of 1 Corinthians 14, that edification requires intelligibility. What would be your kind of final summing up comments there then, Tim, yeah, about our I, debate I would, with this brother? I would similarly state um, that I love Brian to death. I'm great. A moment ago, we heard him talk about a folly and a shame, but I would just say like, this video that we're critiquing here has, again, engaged in appeals to authority, major straw manning against things that I specifically disclaimed, not presenting, misrepresenting, or not sharing the, the full scope of the evidence that I marshaled to justify my point. Um, so I, I, I don't really know like what else to say we'll just sort of watch the end of this and uh close off this video before i'm grateful for his ministry pray for him often um communicate with him regularly and i agree with so much of his position like maybe 90 percent, 95 percent. our positions are so similar although he sees himself as standing on one side of the line and i <laughs> see myself clearly as standing on the other side of the line but if i look at his position like you've just said i would actually say well i think you might be on my side of the line <laughs> right in terms of where Textual i've always confidence. drawn that line and where historically the debate has drawn that line right but i would say that i think as you've said his his refinement of a kjb defense is the strongest that i've ever seen i think it's yep. the healthiest that i've ever seen Agreed. and i hope that if nothing else by adopting a healthier position, some of the rough edges of KJB defense um, can be rubbed off and maybe a little bit more grace shown to the other side. But yeah, at the end of the day, I have to conclude that he has a problem that he'll need to face at some point in justifying where he does draw the line, having given up the traditional distinction between those two positions, or, or maybe we should say the tradition. And as I've tried to make clear in this, this video, I believe that I have already done that. With my sister position, my sister principles of verbatim identicality of wording and substantive doctrinal equivalence. Traditional framing of a textual absolutist uh, KJB defense. He's going to have to justify um, in a way that I don't think he has yet. He writes a lot on it, teaches it. I haven't read everything or seen it all, but I don't think he has justified where he draws that line. And yeah. I think the longer he thinks about it, and the more he presses to where he has to draw that line, the more he'll see that it's a little blurrier than he thought. Right. And that he's not so different from a textual confidence position. Um, and I would just say, where do you brothers draw the line when you say and admit that how you resolve a variant impacts doctrine, but yet not at the macro level? At all. But I do think where he's at right now, as you say, I maybe wouldn't say it quite as harshly as you do in terms of division, but I do think here's what's happening. I think his position unbiblically binds the conscience of believers. Right. You know, in terms of things that we shouldn't be binding people's conscience to a particular translation without biblical warrant. And I don't think he has the biblical warrant to bind the conscience that way. And yet those who follow his teaching are having their consciences bound. And I think Paul has some very clear uh, words in Romans right. and in First um, Corinthians about that principle. And I think Paul would be opposed to it. Yeah. And uh, maybe my final word there would be to Brother Brian, who I pretty I'm pretty sure will watch this. Uh, mm -hmm. You know of our love for you, and we're certainly, I, for one, I'm still willing to go back and forth with you over uh, a yeah. text message or email or what have you. Absolutely. Um, I would encourage you, Brian, to observe the uncharacteristic contortions you had to go to when it comes to defining that word exact to mean, well, actually, it used to be imperfect in this old sense, and therefore, you can't say that the King James translators 
deny that their work work was perfect. That's not like you. I I felt. Look, I have to comment here. This on this sort of poisoning the well going on here. I never thought that if this uh, the, the the video that we've critiqued and reviewed here is not an accurate representation of what I said. Now, look, have these guys said a lot of nice things about me along the way and given me praise for certain things? Certainly, and I acknowledge that. But they've also given me what I believe to be quite a few unfair critiques. So I have mixed feelings about this video. Now, I still count these guys to be um, brothers in Christ. I'm not completely shut down to the idea of continued dialogue. Even since this video was released, I sent them both copies of my book, complimentary copies of my book. So I'm not trying to be... But this, this is an important issue that relates to the basics of our Christian faith. And yes, I do not agree with where these brothers have landed, and they do not agree with where I've landed. But I think you need to think about as a viewer way the, the uncomfortableness of the nature of the praise along with the nature of the critique and how the critique was done and, and the shape and the form that it took. Like, wow, I really am encountering a different Brian Ross here. Um, I would say have that backbone stand up to the people who are expecting you to come up with some way to defend a, a King James only viewpoint, despite what the preface clearly says, uh, the King James translators abjuring, you know, denying that they uh, did perfect work or were inspired. Again, a principle, a, a, an argument that I specifically disclaimed. Okay. So, these brothers are denying that the King James translators claim perfection in any sense. Where I specifically said that they did not claim perfection in the absolute sense. And yet this entire video has straw manned against a claim that I, against something that I specifically disclaimed. Um, let that cause you to do some soul searching and and maybe our questions about verbatim identicality of wording would be good tools to use for that soul searching uh, one more little point of praise if you want to read um, if you want to read up on one little point that I've never seen anybody really address like Brian does the history of the King James Bible in America thing that he did the little mm. booklet I think he sent yeah, me yeah, I've got a, um, a that showed somewhere. his honesty in a way that you know I just haven't seen elsewhere he, he looked at the history and saw that King James editions in the, in there you go. I have that too. Uh, he sent it to me for free, which was kind of him. Um, oh, wonderful. Those editions do differ. And you can't say that the one we have right now, and it absolutely, this form, textual absolutism of the King James Bible itself, is the only form that God blesses because our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents all had very slightly different ones. That right. was the, one of the first things that got me to sit up and take note, that this is a guy who came at the debate with, um, with an honesty that made him be willing to stand up against some of the extremists in his world. So... Mm -hmm. We've offered a lot of a mixture of praise and disagreement here and even calls for uh, change and, and Brian, but I wanted to end with that positive note. Tim, thank you so much for digging on. So they just uh, say goodbye to each other and so forth from there on out. Now I'm going to, I'm planning one more video, a fourth video where I sort of summarize and draw some conclusions here from all of this that we've seen. Um, so I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna end it there and just and just ask the question: Have you trusted Jesus Christ? Have you placed your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and His shed blood for you on the cross as the only payment for your sin? Have you made that choice? Make that choice today. Re stop relying on yourself and your own ability to perform and make God happy with you. We fall short of the glory of God. The Apostle Paul says in Romans three twenty three, God loves you. He sent Jesus Christ His Son to die for you to make satisfaction for your sins, 
to take your place as a substitute, to satisfy the offended justice of God against sin so that he could give you eternal life as a free gift. Trust Jesus Christ today before it's everlasting too late. Thanks for your attention, and we'll see you next time.